Hello, everyone, and welcome to CCK Live. This week, we're going to be talking about VA disability benefits that would be secondary to tinnitus. Um, that is conditions that are caused or aggravated by a service-connected tinnitus disability. My name is Christian McTarnigan, and today I am joined by Bethany Cook and Mike Lestrito. So let's just hop right into it. I think the first thing people are going to want to know, Bethany, is what's tinnitus? Sure. So tinnitus typically refers to the perception of noise or ringing in the ears. Uh, most often, tinnitus is a symptom of an underlying condition, uh, such as hearing loss, an ear injury, or a circulatory system disorder. Uh, it can be extremely uh, bothersome and can lead to significant impairment in everyday life, um, but it is uh, not typically life-threatening. Uh, it's an irritating, it can be a, a constant uh, ringing, buzzing, roaring, clicking, hissing, or humming noise uh, that someone can hear constantly or inter intermittently throughout the day. There are uh, two types of tinnitus, uh, subjective tinnitus and objective tinnitus. Uh, subjective tinnitus is more common. Uh, it's uh, uh, tinnitus, subjective tinnitus is one that only you can hear, uh, and it can be caused by problems in the outer, middle, or inner ear, uh, problems with auditory nerves, uh, or problems with the part of the brain that interprets nerve signals as sound. Uh, whereas objective tinnitus is uh, tinnitus that uh, the doctor can hear when they're performing an, an examination. Uh, this version is extremely rare, uh, but it can be caused by a blood vessel problem, a middle ear bone condition, uh, or muscle contractions. Yes, subjective tinnitus is definitely the more frequent condition. It's one of the only, I don't like to use uh, absolutes, but it's one of the few conditions and disabilities that you can say, hey, I have this, and the VA accepts that as medical proof, basically, um, not just sort of like a, a lay statement that you have the condition. Um, so what are some of the causes, Mike? Yeah, thanks, Christian. Um, there really are a whole host of different causes or potential causes for tinnitus or tinnitus. Um, it, as it relates to a lot of our clients and a lot of veterans, I think maybe the most common cause is exposure to loud noises, right? So we have a lot of veterans who are on active duty, service members who are constantly exposed to loud noises, potentially gunfire, but not necessarily gunfire, um, you know, maybe just loud machinery, armed vehicles, aircraft, um, or really any other combat related or even non-combat related loud noises. So I, th it, from my experience at least, and in my practice, that is the most common cause for veterans who have tinnitus. Um, but there really are, like I said, a whole host of other causes. So you know, age, um, age-related hearing loss is a potential cause. Um, believe it or not, earwax blockage or buildup can potentially lead to tinnitus. Um, you know, changes to the actual ear bone, um, stiffening of the bones in the middle ear, that can affect hearing, that can cause tinnitus. Meniere's, uh, Meniere's disease, um, that's kind of an early indicator or tinnitus can be an early indicator of Meniere's disease, I should say. And then another one that we do commonly see, um, unfortunately, is tinnitus as the result of a traumatic brain injury or some type of trauma uh, to a veteran's, you know, head or body, um, and that you know can lead to uh, the development of tinnitus. All right, so uh, tinnitus is one of the most frequently claimed conditions for service connection by our country's veterans. Um, just to sort of get into the little bit of the nitty gritty about how VA rates it. Um, there's uh, a regulation, 38 CFR 4.87, if you want to take a look. Uh, it's a schedule of ratings for ear. It's diagnostic code uh, 6260. And just to let everybody know, <laughs> you're pretty much only going to get a 10% for your tinnitus. Tinnitus, did I just do it again? Um, and that's because the way that the VA rating schedule works, I won't get into it. There's actually a lot of case law on this, you get one 10% rating for tinnitus in both of your ears. Um, that's just the way that it works. And that's just the way that um, the, the regulation is written. All right. So that's a lot about the condition itself, what it is, what causes it. Let's get into secondary service connection. So um, if a veteran's service connection tinnitus causes uh, a new disability or, or uh, even makes a, an existing disability worse, 
you can get secondary service connection for that other condition because you're already service connected for your tinnitus. So after you prove that you're entitled to service connection, direct service connection for your tinnitus, um, any condition resulting from or made worse by that um, condition will be afforded secondary service connection. Um, although you know the, the ringing in your ears, the tinnitus alone uh, doesn't typically get you a higher rating. Like we said, a high rating, you're gonna get a 10% for both years. Um, and then uh, the secondarily service-connected conditions or disabilities, that can get you a higher rating overall because that's gonna be added to your combined rating. So um, there are some common uh, conditions that are secondarily related to tinnitus. Bethany, you wanna let us know what they are? Sure. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the um, most common uh, conditions that we see secondary tinnitus. Um, it, it's not an exhaustive list, and um, we'll discuss in the comments uh, how these uh, conditions are rated. Uh, but one of the most common conditions that we see secondary tinnitus is um, migraine headaches. Uh, these are a type of headache that can last hours to days, and they're characterized by intense pain that can be accompanied by uh, nausea, uh, nausea, uh, vomiting, sensitivity to lights and sounds, uh, as well as lightheadedness and uh, blurred vision. Uh, the American Migraine Society uh, estimates that roughly 27% of people with tinnitus uh, also suffer from migraines. So while Christian said that tinnitus itself uh, can only get you a rating of 10%, uh, migraines are rated between 0% uh, all the way up to 50%. Uh, they can be extremely debilitating. Uh, so if you have severe migraines, uh, secondary tinnitus, uh, it can boost your, uh, your combined with reading um, to uh, over 50%. <clears throat> Another uh, common condition that can be secondary to tinnitus uh, is a psychiatric condition like depression and anxiety. Uh, so depression is a mental health condition whose symptoms can include persistent feelings of sadness, lack of motivation, difficulty concentrating, change in appetite, and fatigue, uh, whereas anxiety uh, can manifest with intense, excessive, and persistent feelings of worry and fear about everyday situations. Uh, and recent studies have shown that up to 58% of veterans with tinnitus also suffer from depression and anxiety. And so unlike uh, migraine headaches, uh, depression and anxiety can be rated all the way up to 100% disabling. Uh, they're rated using the general rating formula for mental disorders, and they can get you a rating of 0, 10, 30, 50, 70, or 100%. <clears throat> Uh, another condition uh, that can be secondary to tinnitus is a somatic symptom disorder. Uh, this is a disorder characterized by extreme focus on one's physical symptoms, uh, like pain or fatigue, uh, that can lead to major emotional distress and difficulty with social and occupational functioning. So, for example, a veteran with tinnitus might become obsessed with their symptoms of tinnitus and start worrying excessively about them. And a somatic symptom disorder is rated with the same rating criteria as a psychiatric condition, uh, like depression and anxiety. Uh, so it uses the general rating formula for mental disorders that goes all the way up to 100%. Other uh, conditions can be sleep disorders, uh, like insomnia or sleep apnea. Uh, studies have also shown there's an increased prevalence of sleep disorders among veterans with tinnitus. Uh, and these conditions are also rated with the general rating formula for mental, mental disorders, which again can go all the way up to 100%. Um, but one example um, that we see very commonly is obviously if you have tinnitus, you can have that extremely irritating or even painful ringing or buzzing in your ear. Uh, that can result in insomnia, uh, which can lead to a number of other issues like anxiety, depression, headaches. And again, uh, this list uh, isn't exhaustive, um, so you might have an, another condition we didn't discuss here that uh, you believe is secondary tinnitus. Uh, so uh, if you do have that, we'd encourage you uh, to, to file a claim for it and, and talk to your doctor about whether your tinnitus is causing that condition. It's not hard to imagine that if you have painful, really loud ringing in your ears, it's going to be hard to sleep. And lack of sleep can cause a whole host of problems. And so you sort of can extrapolate out, um, you have this, it causes sleep problems, it causes, your sleep problems cause depression, right? All of those secondary conditions are gonna be treated 
as if they were caused by service because the way that the law works, if it's caused by something that was caused by service, you get service connection for it. So, uh, and Bethany, you just mentioned filing a claim for service, service connection, uh, secondary service connection rather. Mike, do you want to get into a little bit of the specifics of that? Sure. And so, you know, if you have a condition that you think is caused by your service connected tinnitus, um, you're going to have to file a new claim for that condition. And so, as many of our viewers know, I think um, as of February 19th, 2019, the law surrounding filing new claims and appealing decisions changed. We are now living in um, what's known as the AMA world. It's uh, a procedural change to the law, it doesn't affect the substance of the law, but it does change how veterans go about filing claims. Uh, previously, in the old system, the legacy system, as many people uh, knew it to be, you know, veterans would file a VA form 21-526 or 21-526EZ. They'd submit the claim for the condition, um, and then you know the uh, the regional office would issue a decision. Things are a little bit different now, um, and so if you're filing a new claim for this condition, um, you have to know whether you have previously filed a claim for this condition before. If you have never filed a claim for this secondary condition, you're going to want to file uh, the VA form 21-526 or 526EZ. Um, again, that's if you're claiming this condition for the first time, service connection for the first time. If, however, though, um, say you've previously filed a claim for depression um, and it was denied years ago and it was never appealed, um, we now are, because of AMA, we are now required to file something called a supplemental claim. It's its own form. Um, VA has a link to it at, on its website, um, but that is a separate claim form that needs to be filed. Um, and typically, veterans will need to either identify evidence or provide evidence that's considered new and relevant. Um, essentially, you know, what has changed? What new evidence can you show um, to reopen, if you will, the previous claim that you submitted that was denied? Um, that can be a statement. That can be a medical record. Um, you know, it, it can be a medical article that you've come about uh, or come upon, um, treatment records, whatever it may be, but uh, you may have to be required to submit that additional evidence. Um, and, so, and so, like I said, the differences between what used to be required under the legacy system are much different now than filing a claim under the AMA system. Veterans are able to file claims on their own through the e-benefits portal. So that's an option. They also can you know, go down to their local regional office and file the claim. Oftentimes, uh, the local regional office will provide some assistance, perhaps. Um, or obviously, you know, they can reach out to a veterans advocate. Um, and you know, the veterans advocate can help kind of navigate this new AMA world that we're living in and properly file the claim. And so that was just the tip of the iceberg there, just so you, you all know. There's a lot of information about AMA and the difference between legacy on our website. Um, so definitely check that out. And just a quick note about the regional offices. Some of them are closed, but they do have um, specific hours or other ways that you can get in contact with them to help file those forms. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Christian. Um, and, and so once veterans actually procedurally file the claim, they're really going to need to demonstrate two things to VA in order to substantively be granted the benefit secondary to their service-connected tinnitus. Um, number one, they're going to need to show a diagnosis, um, in all likelihood, a diagnosis for their secondary condition. So, for instance, taking the example again, you know, a veteran has tinnitus um, service-connected. They also have depression. They think the depression was caused by or at least aggravated by um, their tinnitus, um, they're going to want to file a claim and show some evidence that they do have a diagnosis for depression. Um, and, and second, they're going to need to show uh, or provide some type of medical evidence that links their condition that they're claiming to their service-connected tinnitus. Um, that's oftentimes medical evidence, um, maybe a, a treatment record, a letter from your physician, uh, you know, a private medical opinion that you went out and obtained. Usually, it's some type of medical evidence that needs to be submitted to provide that link or nexus, as they call it, to your service-connected tinnitus. Yeah, ne nexus is going to be probably one of the most important elements of, of, a, of a tinnitus secondary service connection claim. That's like because what I said, um, you know, you're already going to be service-connected for the tinnitus. And so there's not really going to be any dispute about that. But showing that there is that link between your tinnitus and your anxiety, your tinnitus and your diagnosed sleep disorder, 
that's going to be a really important element of being successful in a secondary service connection claim. Um, and, you know, again, just to highlight, lay statements can help this process. They might not always be uh, the, the only thing that you need um, in terms of secondary service connection, but it's always very helpful because VA is supposed to consider them. And uh, the only thing that I'll add is that um, there are studies and you can submit studies or medical treatise evidences, uh, medical treatise evidence. Those studies are gonna be linked in the comments. Those are also things that you can use to um, you know, support the, the medical link you need between your tinnitus and um, your uh, secondarily service-connected or hopefully secondarily service-connected condition. Um, so that's all we really have uh, formally for you today. Um, there's, there's more information on our uh, CCK Live page about secondary service connection and aggravation if you want a little bit more detail about some of these concepts we're talking about today. Um, but before we leave you, we always like to give some closing remarks. Bethany, anything to add before we close? Sure. So I would just say uh, regarding the medical nexus, uh, obviously the easiest option is if your own uh, treating physician can provide that for you. Uh, but one thing um, that uh, the VA can do uh, to help develop your claim is schedule a compensation and pension examination. Uh, but uh, to get a compensation and pension examination in the hopes that it can provide a positive medical nexus, uh, you do have to trigger uh, the VA's duty to assist. Uh, so uh, submitting uh, medical studies like Christian was talking about that show that your secondary condition can be linked to tinnitus, uh, that can be uh, very helpful in trying to trigger the duty to assist so that the VA will afford you a compensation and pension examination. One thing that I think is important to keep in mind um, for tinnitus is that oftentimes the veteran's MOS or military occupational specialty is really critical. Um, to determining whether they were exposed to certain noise exposure at a level that would um, allow VA to link their tinnitus to their service, uh, you know, in that way. And so I, I think it's important to kind of look at that, keep that in mind. I believe VA um, on its website or in its adjudication manual lists some of these MOSs um, and the likelihood that someone who served in that role was exposed to certain noise exposure. So, you know, if you're having trouble on the front end of this sort of claim, just getting tinnitus service connected in the first instance, that may be something to look to. Um, because like I said, uh, kind of earlier, a lot of our veterans were exposed to some sort of noise exposure. Uh, and that is oftentimes the basis for their tinnitus claim. Well, thank you very much for everyone joining us today and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest updates on important veterans topics.